You've all heard numerous, all too many, I'm sure, Pearly Gates jokes. Well, here's one more. Maybe you've heard it. A taxi cab driver and a Catholic priest died and went to heaven. They're standing at the pearly gates, and Peter meets them, and he says, I'm going to usher you into your heavenly abode. And he takes the taxi cab driver first, but the priest is kind of following along, and he sees that this taxi cab driver is being ushered into an amazing mansion. Glorious, huge, finely appointed with all the latest technology. Could not ask for more. And the priest is thinking, oh boy, if he's getting this, what am I going to get? Woo! And then Peter takes the priest over to a little shack. There's just a little bed with springs sticking out and a little old black and white TV. And the priest says, what in the world is going on here? I've served the Lord all these years. I have done countless worship services. I've preached thousands of sermons. Why do I have this and he has that? To which Peter says, well, frankly, during most of your sermons, the people slept. But during every single drive, all of his passengers prayed fervently. <laughs> so to cover the bases, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we thank you that you are a living God that we pray to. We thank you for Jesus. And we ask that his reality might become real and personal for all of us as we're gathered here today. We love you, and we thank you for your love, which gives us all of our love for you and one another. Meet us here. Meet us where we are. Take us to where you want us to be, namely, into your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, of course, the theme for the day is fairly obvious, the resurrection of Jesus. There are four choices, actually five, if you count the book of Acts. We're looking at John's version of the gospel, uh, the gospel of John version of the uh, resurrection of Jesus. Now, what I want you to do is, is recognize some things in this depiction. Because every gospel writer has their own unique nuance. In John's version, he's especially focused on Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was arguably the closest person on earth to Jesus Christ. And so, he wants us to see something very important that's going on regarding Mary Magdalene. She, she was with him all the way to the end. And she is grieving. She is disoriented. And something happens very, very obviously that changes her in a moment. I want you to see if you can pick it out in the story. When it, it just kind of snaps and she's awakened. She looks into the tomb and she doesn't see Jesus. And she is utterly heartbroken. What she sees are all the, the linens, the burial linens. Now what's odd about that and interesting about that is if someone were to steal something out of a grave site back then, the thing that was most valuable were the grave clothes. That was the only thing that was valuable. But those are the only things left. Something different is going on here. The body's gone, but the grave clothes are there. She runs into a guy she thinks is the gardener. Much to her surprise, it happens to be the resurrected Jesus. Listen to the way John puts it in his 20th chapter, the first 18 verses. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. 
Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary, Mary Magdalene, she stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over into, look, over, look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary... She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead and to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Well, we have a, a lot of kids over in Sunday school right now. There was a, a, a child in Sunday school who, after having been there, his parent asked, well, what did you learn today? Did you talk about anything particular? Uh, he said, nothing. Oh, that's typical of my kids. You know, what did you learn today? What did you talk about? Nothing. You got to kind of, it's like squeezing blood out of a turnip to get anything out of them, right? You know what I'm talking about. He said, nothing. Well, they said, well, come on, didn't you study Jesus today? To which he replied, no, he wasn't even there. <laughs> Contrast that with the story of G.K. Chesterton. Some of you know of G.K. Chesterton. He was a famous journalist who was converted to Christianity. He's in London, England. He wrote a great deal. And a reporter caught him on a sidewalk curbside in London and wanted to ask him about his conversion to Christianity and, and, you know, curious about it all. And he said, listen, Chesterton, if, if the risen Christ suddenly appeared at this very moment and stood behind you, what would you do? To which Chesterton looked him right in the eye and said, he is. Do you believe that? Because... The only other alternative is that we're just here to talk about a history lesson. This is something that happened in the past and it really has no bearing on us today. It's not very controversial. It's certainly not very personal for you. And we can just check the box and say we heard a good history uh, lesson or uh, something like that. But instead, what we know is that Jesus breaks into history. And he does so by coming alive from the grave. And it's incredibly controversial for you and for me. The living, resurrected Jesus stirs things up. And we've not been the same ever since, have we? I'm reminded of in the 19th century, some of you speaking of history lessons, remember Harriet Beecher Stowe? She wrote about Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was a little fiction book, but it was telling the truth about slavery. It was the, in those days, in the 19th century, a bit like YouTube or Facebook today in terms of going viral and coalescing everyone who had anything, any sentiment toward slavery. And they rallied the abolitionists through that little book. One day she got to meet Abraham Lincoln in the White House. And Abraham Lincoln went up to her and he is reported to have said these words, So... This is the little lady who started this great war. You know, the Jesus of history is nice. It's a nice little children's story. But the resurrected living Christ, here and now, is starting something up. He's starting something with you and with me and with all creation. He defeated sin and death. And he really began there with shaking things up. Why? Why? Because he wants it to be personal for you and for me and for all people. He lives now for you. It's not just 
the historical event we're talking about. He lives to give you new life. Little boy had a friend in the neighborhood. He was one of these neighbors that was a grandfatherly figure, came over and pushed him on his swing set day after day, and he was just, the little boy adored him, and then he passed away. The little boy's mother tried to explain it to him, but she had always prided herself on being irreligious, on not giving pat religious answers, and so she started to say things like, well, son, you just have to accept the fact that this is the natural order of things. This is just the cycle of life. And he's going into the ground. And in the springtime, when the daffodils start to rise, you'll know that he fertilized the ground so that you'll in some sense be in touch with him in that way. To which the little boy said, But mom, I don't want him to be fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, Jesus rose from the dead so that you just won't be fertilizer. So you'll be more than that. So that you and I have a hope, a future. Not just after we die, but here and now. He died and resurrected to give us ultimate worth, ultimate value. There's a true story about a young executive who was working for IBM. He, uh, he was involved in a gamble, a risky venture, and he ended up costing IBM $10 million. True story. He was called in to the office of the founder and leader of IBM for 40 years, Tom Watson. Of course, he saw the writing on the wall. He came with his resignation prepared and threw it down in front of Tom Watson and said, Sir, I'm, I've done a horrible thing here. I'm sure you want my resignation and here it is. To which Mr. Watson said, Are you kidding me? I have just invested $10 million educating you. I can't afford your resignation. Good lesson in that. Guys, Jesus paid a heavy price for you to restore you, to keep you, to call you home. The price of His blood. He spilled it so that you might never be apart from Him again. He, he gave you His life to redeem your life, to restore your life, to regenerate your life. As I was thinking about this, I thought there's a, a kind of a crude little analogy that I've just gone through myself. Some of you know I went through a, a medical procedure for a, some torn tendons in my shoulder. Instead of having surgery, I did this thing called PRP. It's called plate, pl uh, plasma enriched platelets. And what they do is they withdraw your blood. Now, if you don't like blood stuff, cover your ears. They, they withdraw my blood, and then they spin it down to where it's highly enriched plasma, and then they re-inject it into the tears in my tendon. It was the most painful thing I've ever been through. I've never given birth, but I can only imagine it's close to that. <laughs> Nearly fainted, cried like a baby. It was awful. Um, but the idea is brilliant. The idea is that it's your own blood that creates healing, regenerates, restores, renews. That's what Jesus did on the cross. His blood regenerates you, restores you, renews you. His sacrifice does this so that you might live freely as a child of God, never apart from Him again. He does this so that you might enjoy living to your greatest potential. This is not pie in the sky, buy and buy stuff. It's about living your greatest potential here and now. His blood sacrifice restores you to know that you are a miracle. Been given another chance. Annie Lamott, you've read some of her books perhaps. She tells a story about teaching Sunday school and a little boy named Mason who's been gone for a while because he had cancer. His first day back in Sunday school and he's, she overhears him talking to a little girl about where he's been and he says to her, you know, I used to have brain cancer. I was in a coma and then I was here again. Isn't that good? She uh, overheard it and she interjected and she said, Mason, you are a miracle. To which he replied, yes, I am a miracle. And he made this like this. Jesus died and was resurrected so that you and I might be here again. And friends, that's a miracle. It's something you couldn't do for yourself. It is a miracle. That was Mary Magdalene's story. And her story is our story. Think about it. She was in a kind of coma. 
She was in a stupor, in grief. She, was, she didn't even recognize Jesus right in front of her. She had been with him all along. Why would she not recognize him? Because she is so beside herself, disoriented and lost. And how did she snap out of it? I told you to look for it, right, in the reading? Did you hear it? What happened? Jesus called her by name. Very simply, he said, Mary. And then, she's here again. A miracle. Think about it. When you're called by a name, it gets your attention, doesn't it? When you're called by a name, it's, it means something to you. My, uh, my wife often travels out of town, and, and when she's traveling out of town, I have to figure out what I'm going to eat. And so... Um, this particular occasion a couple months ago, I had a coupon for honey baked ham and uh, you know one of their one of their dinners and so I called ahead to you know go and find out where they are and I go down there to pick up my dinner and I walk in and this woman who's behind the counter and I'd never been there before and I'd never seen this woman before she says hi Tim <laughs> do, 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 do. Wow, I don't know what's up with that. Maybe it was caller ID, I don't know, but uh, it was weird. Maybe she was an angel. It, Howard Schultz created Starbucks. Anybody here like Starbucks? Remember the old days when you'd walk in, you'd order your cup of joe, and they would ask you your name. And what would they do? They'd write it on the cup. And then, when your order was up, they'd say, Jerry? Lisa? Hester? Tim? And that was his strategy. Why was it his strategy that you would be called, every customer would be called by name? Why? Because he wanted you to feel like you were right at home. Calling you by name makes you feel right. It humanizes you. It gives you worth and dignity, a comfort level, right? We humanize and show affection and respect by calling people by name. And the opposite is true as well. I'll never forget, I was in New Jersey in seminary, serving as a chaplain at Robert Wood Johnson Medical Center. And I met a guy who was in for a heart condition. And he had these tattoos on his wrist, on his forearm actually. There were a bunch of numbers with a symbol. As I began talking with him, he shared with me that he was a survivor of a concentration camp in Nazi Germany. And every prisoner was given a serial number. And they were only called by that number. They didn't have a name. They had a number. It was their way of dehumanizing them, humiliating them. You see, the opposite is true. Jesus called people by name. He called people by name. He gave them dignity and worth, affection and purpose. Think about some other examples. Simon, son of John, he called him at the beginning of his ministry, and he renamed him. What did he name him? Peter. And what does Peter mean? Rock. And on this rock, the whole church is built. Wow, what a name. What a deal. I mean, Jesus really, he really means something serious when he calls you by name. And then he calls out to this friend of his, Lazarus, come on out. Lazarus, Lazarus had been dead. And with the calling of his name, he's given new life. And then he looks up into a tree and says, Zacchaeus, uh, you're trying to hide. Come on down. We're going to have dinner together. It's a show of friendship. A lifelong friendship. And Jesus calls us by name. And it means the exact same thing. It means you're going to be a rock. I have a future for you when he calls you by name. It means I'm calling you to new life too. I'm going to be your forever friend too. Remember in the beginning of the Bible? What's the first thing, the very first thing that Adam is assigned to do after everything is created? Do you remember? He names the animals. Why? So that he can participate in a godlike activity, giving meaning and purpose to all the things that exist. That's a godlike activity, naming. Naming someone, naming something is a powerful, powerful thing. And so Jesus... Speaking to Mary Magdalene, simply calls her name, Mary. Mary. And suddenly she came alive again. She was here again. Now, 
Mary Magdalene, interesting figure. In history, we've often thought that she was the one depicted in Luke chapter 7. The woman who was of ill repute washing Jesus' feet. But in fact, in that chapter, the woman is not named. We don't know that it was Mary. It could have been. It might have been. Because in the very next chapter, chapter 8, Jesus is healing a woman who has been possessed by demons. And he names her. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. She is, from then on, the closest person on earth to Jesus. So, perhaps, just maybe, when he says Mary to her outside that tomb, maybe she's having a flashback. Maybe she's thinking about that first time he called her by name and gave her dignity and meaning and purpose and healing. We connect in deep ways to our name and to the names of others that are meaningful to us. I've asked Mark to help me out in my sermon. Mark Nygaard uh, is going to sing a song for you now, and I want you to hear what this song is about. It, it's written by a 95-year-old man named Fred Stobaugh. Fred was married to Lorraine for 73 years. They had been dating for two years before that, so 75 years of his life he had given to her. There was a local recording studio that was putting on a song contest and they asked local artists to send in recordings of their songs but instead on this particular day all they got were some lyrics because Fred's not a musician. He can't sing, he can't play a instrument whatsoever. But they were so inspired by Fred's story because they found out that one month before they received this song in the mail from him, his wife had passed away. And you'll see, you'll hear in this song that he again and again just calls out her name because he misses her so much. Because he loves her so very much. This is called, Oh Sweet Lorraine. that's how Jesus feels about you. He sings your name. He calls your name, just like he did Mary. That's what, that's what made her come alive. That's what made her here again. He loves you like that. And the good news of the gospel is that it never, ever ends. Amen? Let's pray together. We thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much that you know us intimately. You call us home. You call us to be your own. You have your own song 
and you, you've given yourself to us. Receive us back that we might be yours and yours alone. We thank you for overcoming the grave and for calling us by name. Amen. this morning as we celebrate the day you overcame sin and death. We praise you and glorify your name, Lord Jesus. You are the risen Savior. Hallelujah. Mountains bow down and seas roar at the sound of your name. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are name above all names. Your death and resurrection, Lord Jesus, restored us back as children of God. And on this glorious day, Father, as your children, we pause now and ask you to remember those who we lift up to you. We pray this morning for George Werner. 
We want to thank God as George is doing better after his operation as he had complications. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the presence of Marilyn this morning back in our midst. And also, Lord, we thank you for the presence of, of Pete back in our midst this morning. Father, we pray for Joe Rush this morning. He uh, continued improvement from last Wednesday, and he may be released from the hospital tomorrow. We thank you, Lord, for that, and we ask your continued hand on him. Father, we pray for Chuck Freer this morning. He had surgery for a hematoma in his leg, and we pray, Lord, for healing for him. And Father, we pray for Cynthia Brown. She is in hospice, Lord. She's had a three-year battle with a brain tumor. We pray, Lord, for your continued uh, presence with her, Lord, and for her family as she suffers, Father. Lord, we ask you to bless our families who gather together this day. We pray that the love that binds them be grounded in you. We pray for Barbara and Ken in Haiti. May they be blessed by your risen presence. We pray for our pastors, our staff, our leaders, and our congregation. We pray, Lord, for the homeless in our community and all over the world. We pray for those, Lord, who do not know you, Lord Jesus. May you, Holy Spirit of God, hound them with your love. And in your spirit of love and unity, may the prayer that you taught us to pray be a sweet sound in your ears as we say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.